Yo, what is up, guys? DPX here. Uh, I'm got to catch up on a few movies to review and a new episode of The Mandalorian. Um, so here it is. Uh, here's my review for some movies and uh, an episode of a series. Before we get started, though, you, you know what to do. Be sure to like this video, subscribe if you're new, turn on notifications, and leave a comment, and you'll be a loyal subscriber. Before we review any of the movies, let's review the fourth episode of The Mandalorian. Now, every episode just got better and better and better. With episode one great, episode two great, and episode three fantastic. I gave that a perfect ten, to be honest. So what about this fourth one? Directed by Bryce Dallas Howard, and, you know, starring, you know, Pedro Pascal as The Mandalorian. And, uh, introduces, like... Uh, Cara Dune, played by Gina Carano, who's actually got an MMA background, and you can see that when she's fighting people in the episode, and I thought that was pretty cool. Basically, what happens here is uh, Mando lands on, on this planet with, uh, you know, Baby Yoda. It's got, like, the, it's, like, sort of just a normal planet, I feel. He, he stumbles across Cara Dune, and, uh, you know, they get into, like, a fight and everything, and all that happens, and then they figure they have to leave because an ATST is here, and everyone else can't fight the ATST, but then they realize, wait, we can teach them how to fight the ATST, and then they uh, fight the ATST, but then there are other bad guys there, too. This is a bit tricky. I don't think it's better than the third episode. The third episode was great, I feel. Um, fantastic. Um, but... This might have been a bit, just a bit, of a filler episode. I don't see how this could have progressed the plot. Uh, it also had, like, this bait-and-switch, like, Oh, you, I'm leaving, uh, you know, Baby Yoda here. And I'm like, no, you can't leave Baby Yoda there. Like, is, is he done? He's not in He's not in here anymore? Uh, no, he's just... It, he actually is not gonna be left there, and he's just gonna... I mean, I, I, I love, I, I, I'd love to see Baby Yoda more, uh, you know, so I'm, I'm happy he's still gonna be there, but, like, it's sort of a bait and switch, I feel, which wasn't necessarily, I didn't really like that that much, and, uh, you know, uh, one thing I do like is, uh, you know, the Mandalorian himself, he's actually talking in this, it actually shows some personality, too, there's even a glimpse where he takes his helmet off, but you can't, you can't even see, like, the back of his head, though. It doesn't show his head at all, it just shows him putting his helmet on a, uh, on, on a table. That's it. And, you know, just, and then there's, like, talk that he's talking, he, he hasn't taken his helmet off in front of, um, anyone since he was a little kid. Like, damn. Like, th th that goes deep, honestly. There's also some nice action in here, I, th I feel. It's pretty great. Um, my main problem, I, I said the two problems. One, it was like a filler episode, which I'll get into in a bit. And two, the bait and switch. With, uh, Baby Yoda. How he's not gonna leave, like... The reason why he didn't leave is because, he, uh, someone actually shot at him, and... So, like, he, he was a target there, and, you know, they couldn't, they couldn't leave him there. I get that, but, I mean, uh, it would have been very, like, it would have been huge if, if he stayed. You also see, like, a father-son connection between the Mandalorian and Baby Yoda. More so in this one than in any other episode. And I thought that was a splendid touch. Now, about this being a filler episode, um... I feel this, like, didn't really, after the huge progression in the third episode, like, that, that had some, that created some serious conflict for the rest of the season, this one didn't really, you know, do anything with that, aside from going to another planet, trying to get away from there, and that, they tried to stay to that planet, but they, they didn't, um... I mean, it, it, it introduces new characters, too, and I hope those characters come back in future episodes. And I also also showed more connection between Mandalorian and Baby Yoda, and it showed more personality from the Mandalorian 
But as for anything to uh, move the season along, it didn't really do much, I feel. I still found it very entertaining, you know. Um, it, it does seem to be more connecting to the movies now that it includes an ATST. Um, and I, I thought how they integrated the ATST was pretty cool. And they even had it like, a bit like a chameleon, like, it blends in with the background, it's sort of invisible. Yeah, I thought that was pretty cool. In conclusion, The Mandalorian, Episode 4, or Chapter 4, The Sanctuary, what this one's called. It, it's it's good, I mean, it. I can't really see any of these being terrible or anything. This is nowhere near terrible. Bryce Dallas Howard made a, you know, a good episode. Um, does it live up to the third one? No. But in the end, I give Mandalorian Episode 4, or Chapter 4, The Sanctuary, an 8 out of 10. Now it's time to review a Disney Plus original, like a Disney original movie on Disney Plus, Noel, starring Anna Kendrick, Bill Hader, and Billy Eichner. I, uh, I want to say that the cast is good, and I'm not going to lie. The movie made me chuckle a little bit, but I, I was kind of interested in the movie when I first saw, like, the trailer, when it was dropped at D23. I, I didn't think it was going to be, like, anything crazy, but I didn't think it was going to be terrible, but... <sighs> oh boy, it was not very good. Now, let me tell you, it is, it could, it's, a, at times, it's, like, nice and charming. Like, there's this scene where, like, with a deaf person, and that just hits you, you know? There's a scene with a, a kid, and it hits you, but, like, oh, boy. This movie is not good. Um, so, it has, a. it's about, like, Anna Kendrick and, uh, Bill Hader, who are both uh, children of Santa Claus, their uh, brother and sister. Uh, Santa, you know, passes down the torch to Bill Hader's character, Nick, and uh, he, you know, it's a bit stressful for him, a bit of a stressful job, and he goes for a vacation. And, uh, you know, uh, Anna Kendrick's character, Noelle, uh, is getting blamed for all that because she told him to take, like, a the weekend off, and he ended up taking, like, forever off, and, um, pretty much, like, everyone hates, uh, Anna Kendrick now, in this movie, and, uh, it's her job to find, uh, Bill Hader, and, um, and then he finds her, uh, she finds him, but then it turns out, uh, no, uh, fucking Anna Kendrick's now Santa, and then, it gives, the first time, originally, I had no clue what the message was. Because to be honest, I don't think the movie does a good job of telling you what the message is. But then after I watched it, uh, again, yeah, I watched it again. To, to understand the message, I realized that the message is probably, giving joy is just as nice as getting joy. I think that's the message. Like, see, I'm not sure what the message is, and that's not really a good thing. Of course, I, I've heard some people, like, trash this movie because of how low budget it is. Or, rather, how, like, poorly, like, put together this movie is. Like, the special effects and stuff are bad, but it's low budget. But they are very unbearable, in my opinion. I mean, fuck, like, there's this one scene where Anna Kendrick is, like, at this fucking, like, mental hospital or something, and then you see outside the, uh, outside the building, there's, like, a sleigh, and you can, s oh my god, it looked, it looked so bad. Like, the editing was so bad. Now, I want to say that, uh, you know, the cast is good. I wouldn't say anyone gives a bad performance in this movie. Anna Kendrick is fantastic, you know, Bill Hader's fantastic, Billy Eichner's fantastic, everyone's great in this movie. 
The problem is that the movie, like I, I also said, uh, I, I ch chuckled a few times because the movie is a little bit funny, but other times the humor just fell completely flat. And there's other times where it just gives off those vibes that it's a low budget movie. I get that, like, it gives off those vibes because, I mean, it is low budget, but holy fuck, it doesn't give off those vibes. But I shouldn't have expected too much. It's a it's a Disney Plus original on launch day again. This movie was not terrible, it was not awful, it wasn't anything like that. But you can probably skip this one. In conclusion. Noel is, you know, it's got its moments, it's charming at times, it's a little funny at times, but overall, it's just not a good film. In the end, I give Noel a 5.7 out of 10. Next up is Lady and the Tramp, and uh, this is the other Disney Plus original on Disney Plus. Despite being that... It sort of seems like it's was supposed to be theatrical. I don't know why it just gives off those vibes, but yeah, it is obviously with a much lower budget. Plus, this is like one of five, you know, movies that were uh, live action remakes from Disney this year. So maybe it was a good idea that this didn't come out in theaters. I mean, I'm already like. After watching The Lion King, I don't want to see any more live-action remakes, or at least give money to them, but, you know, I didn't give money to this movie, so... That's cool, at least. Anyways... Lady and the Tramp is, uh... I mean... Is it as bad as The Lion King? <laughs> Fuck no. It's actually way better. I actually wouldn't say way better. For one, it gives off... Sort of... The same problem... One of the same problems, at least, that um that the Lion King did, and it was emotionless animals. But the thing is, you see, the dogs are the only animals that are emotionless. They're most they're mostly the only animals in the whole movie, but it's still it's still really noticeable. Plus, there's like it the whole talking thing, like. Let me explain this. These these are actual real dogs. They're not CG, but they but there's slight CG to make it look like they're talking. That can that looks honestly really weird sometimes. Sometimes you can see their mouths barely moving, and other times uh, th there's like one ch shot with a uh, with like lady like looking at the camera, but then she turned her head away, and as she did that. She started talking, but if you look closely, she's barely moving her mouth. Like, jeez. So yeah, as for like the story, it's basically the same thing as the one from the 50s. I'm not quite sure why this one was remade or anything. Like, it, it I never found the original one to really be that good. It's the basic, like, good girl meets bad guy story. Another thing is, like... Back then was when, like, you know, segregation was still a thing, you know, people were still being segregated, homosexuals weren't really accepted, stuff like that. And it just feels weird now in, like, a modern time, and uh, in modern day where, like, that's not really a problem anymore. Another thing that I still had a problem with is uh, with the, that one scene with the cats, they are obviously CG, and th they looked... They emoted so much, and they looked like they were CG. So much. That it just looked weird. It just didn't look right. Other than that, it's Lady and the Tramp. With uh, some added scenes, you know. I think Tessa Thompson does a good job. And Justin Therox does a good job. You know, the cast does a pretty good job. You know, the dog finder, the dog keeper, uh... I don't, I don't know the actor's name, but uh, he he's fantastic. Uh, he steals it for me. But it's just, it's Lady and the Tramp. 
nothing more, nothing less, just with some emotionless dogs eating spaghetti. In conclusion, Lady and the Tramp is a movie that sure exists, but I'd honestly say it's better than Noel. It's still Lady and the Tramp. It's still magical. It's got that Disney charm, and uh, it's Lady and the Tramp. And p many people do have soft spots for that. So in the end, I give Lady and the Tramp a 6.5 out of 10. Last thing I'll be reviewing is The Irishman, released on Netflix and, you know, movie theaters. A select few, directed by Martin Scorsese. And starring Robert De Niro, Al Pacino, and Joe Pesci, who, uh, you know, that last one especially doesn't really make many movies anymore, so it's really great when he's in one. And let me tell you, this movie was fantastic, I feel. There's one thing I want to get out first. My only problem with the movie, and uh, or any problem I have with it, is... Don't mind that noise, but any problem I have with it has to do with this. So, the movie's three and a half hours long. That's, uh, that's pretty long. Um, now, I don't, I'm not saying that's a problem. Obviously, like, you make a movie, uh, Martin Scorsese makes a movie with Robert De Niro, Joe Pesci, and Al Pacino. Yeah, make it as long as you want. But I'm sure it can be a little much if you go to the movies and see it on Netflix you can watch it in like parts and that's kind of what I did because like okay I, I watched it yesterday on Thanksgiving today's actually Thanksgiving when I'm recording it but I watched it on Thanksgiving and you know my family came over when I was in the middle of watching it so I had to stop it so that's that and to be honest I don't suggest you do it that way I suggest find like four hours, four free hours on your hand that you have, and watch this movie because it's worth it. So, w what is The Irishman? It's a, it's like a crime movie, a crime movie. Uh, it's a gangster movie, you know. Uh, Robert De Niro plays a, uh, you know, a, a character perfect for him. He plays the Irishman, like that's his name. Al Pacino plays Jimmy Hoffa, which uh, is a real person, by the way. I, I also must add that this uh, that this movie is kind of based off of a true story. I'm not too uh, I don't know too much about the actual story, but um, the movie is based off of a true story. Um, and I I feel like that's way more intriguing see, like, how well they followed it, and from what I've read, pe people that know about this true story, it seems that, uh, this follows it pretty well. <clears throat> you know, Joe Pesci is here, like, he's practically retired, so it's great to see him here. Um, he, he plays Russell Bufalino, um, and he, he's fantastic. Um, everyone's fantastic in this movie. Like, if th their three main stars are people that, like, you know, it's not too common where they get, like, these kinds of roles. Especially Joe Pesci, who doesn't get many roles at all nowadays. And, uh, most of the movie is just these three just talking to each other, just bonding. And, uh, that sounds boring, but, like, no, it's actually pretty, like, entertaining. And, you know, Al Pacino, he's, like... His character is fantastic, and for him, because he just yells a lot, and you have to watch it to understand. And I do know that's a huge cop out, but you really do. Also, yeah, this is rated R, but um, it's there's not too much violence in it. I wouldn't say. So if you uh, are sensitive to like violent shit, uh, you can watch this. It it's mostly rated R because of the language that's used. Um, yeah, I, I found this movie to be, I didn't have many problems with it. It can be a bit of a drag, like, towards the beginning, somewhere down the middle. Because there, there's three and a half hours, there's a lot they did in those three and a half hours, and most of it was people talking, but 
they somehow made that interesting. They made they made that entertaining. Just these three talk. I mean, you put you have Robert De Niro, Joe Pesci, and Al Pacino all talking, and you have Martin Scorsese behind it. If these three are talking, just talking to each other, like that's that's amazing. It's entertaining as fuck. Obviously, I also like how um. It's also worth noting the de-aging. Um, many people were worried about, like, if the de-aging would be, like, you know, a problem at all, if it would be too noticeable. Some people said it was noticeable at first, and then not noticeable later on. They didn't even care. I, I didn't notice it at all. It, was, it just never, it never came by me that it was... That these people were de-aged. That Robert De Niro was de-aged. Joe Pesci was de-aged. Al Pacino's de-aged. Everyone's de-aged. Like, that never came across me once. Um, and more on Al Pacino. Uh, well, no, not Al Pacino. I already talked about him. But uh, Robert De Niro, like, he, he gives one of the best performances he's ever given in this movie. Like... A lot of things he says, it doesn't even feel like it's scripted. Like, it's, it obviously is, but it really doesn't feel that way. And uh, in a good way, too. Like, it just sounds so natural what he's saying. I also like how this is sort of told as a bit of a story. Like, everything you see happening isn't, like, happening at the moment. Like, you're being told by Robert De Niro's point of view. He's like... He's telling you a story, and at the end, it it ends with him older, like in a in a, in a hospital. Um, and I I thought that was just a splendid touch right there. In conclusion, if you don't mind sitting through three and a half hours of three mega stars talking, and if you don't find that entertaining, you're probably not going to enjoy this movie. But no, trust me. If you do, this is, this movie was entertaining. It entertained the hell out of me. With uh, a few slow parts of the movie. Other than that, it it's great. One of the best movies of the year, maybe. In the end, I give The Irishman a 9 out of 10. So, that, those are my reviews for... Mandalorian Episode 4, The Irishman, Lady and the Tramp, and Noel. Four very similar things. Anyways, uh, what are your thoughts on any of these? Uh, did you like them? Did you not like them? Be sure to like this video, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye-bye.